Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the SaaS Connect one-on-one -on -one series. I'm Bob Moore. I'm the CEO of Crossbeam and a board member of the Cloud Software Association. Uh, super excited to be chatting with Scott Brinker today. We're, we're going to get uh, into his background, the work he's doing at, at HubSpot, and the ways it might impact the technology partner ecosystem at large out there. Uh, but before we dive in, a quick plug for SaaS Connect the in-person conference, which is happening November 9th and 10th in San Francisco. Uh, Crossbeam team is going to be there in full force. Uh, it's put on by the Cloud Software Association. If you go to sasconnect.org, you can get all the details for that. But it's uh, teeing up to be a really exciting time. Uh, so I, I hope to see a lot of folks there that are in the crowd today and uh, that are in the, the community at large. Um, okay, so uh, Sunir's done a really good job of being the hype man for this session uh, with uh, scandalous headlines like the way HubSpot is, is changing the way uh, that apps are built and app ecosystems are made and the way that marketplaces work. And uh, I think there is uh, a lot of really interesting stuff to get at in our conversation with Scott today uh, because he's really uh, the, the mastermind of a lot of that work and, and someone who's been able to have a major influence in the development of that ecosystem for HubSpot. So um, we're going to probably start out by spending a little bit of time diving right into that. And then the other fun stuff with Scott is he's he's a man with a million stories. Um, you know, he's chief MarTech himself. I think uh, I'm a big, I read a lot of venture capital uh, like pitch decks and I swear you can't go through two of them without seeing the the MarTech 5000 infographic like weaving its way into people's total addressable market story. Um, so much fun stuff we'll, we'll uh, get to in the, the back half of the presentation here. But I wanna start with HubSpot and uh, Scott, maybe just a, a really one-on-one level starting point for people if you'll indulge us and uh, I doubt anyone doesn't know the answer to this question, but let's let's make sure we we get everybody in the loop. Can you tell us a little bit about HubSpot, the company, and what it does, and then specifically what your role is there? Yeah, well, thanks so much for uh, having me here. Really looking forward to this chat. Um, so yeah, HubSpot uh, started as uh, the inbound marketing company, creating uh, software for marketers uh, to really be able to help uh, inbound marketing as a methodology really succeed. Uh, you know, some of that was software, some of that, quite frankly, was the HubSpot Academy and just helping to teach people a new way to do marketing in our digital world. Uh, but over time, the company, uh, you know, has expanded from, uh, you know, its marketing tool set to have uh, capabilities for sales teams, for service organizations, uh, and really has evolved into being a true CRM platform company. And I, I use that word platform because, uh, yeah, that's the connection point, uh, you know, into the work that uh, my team is doing, uh, you know, uh, several years ago, uh, you know, uh, Brian and Dharmesh, the co-founders of HubSpot, you know, very excited about the growth HubSpot was going through, the, the, the products that HubSpot itself was creating, but recognizing that, yeah, really, you know, the, the next level of what a company can really do is not just its own products, but how it opens up you know, those foundations so that other software companies can either integrate it and, you know, and we can give customers, uh, you know, the value of, you know, solution A and solution B together, uh, you know, solve a whole bunch of additional use cases. Uh, but even starting to like look at ways that companies could be created by building on the HubSpot platform as a starting point. Uh, so it's been my uh, mission to, uh, you know, build out this, uh, you know, app platform ecosystem uh, and pretty excited about the momentum that we've uh, seen these past few years. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about what that universe looked like when you joined and kind of just what the current state of the world is today? Well, you know, reading uh, the content that you and your team produce, yeah, I feel like the pattern HubSpot uh, has been going through is one you, you, you've seen in a lot of different contexts, which is, you know, I mean, most companies start out, they've got their own product vision, you know, what's the problem they're solving for their customers? And then they're like, oh, okay, there's a few of these other companies that are very closely related to what we're doing. So they start to create partnerships, you know, that tend to even just be a bespoke way of, you know, getting, you know, a specific integration, you know, or a specific go-to-market opportunity, you know, with partners directly connected to that mission. 
you know, and then over time, these things start to expand into an ecosystem and there becomes this tipping point, you know, where it becomes less about everything becoming a, like a bespoke partnership, you know, and more of like, okay, is, is there a larger pattern here? You know, is there a way to accelerate this, you know, so that instead of, you know, having like a dozen, you know, partners with very specific things, you're actually able to create an ecosystem where you have hundreds of partners, uh, you know, and it's increasingly then those partners who are bringing the innovation and the vision of what's possible, you know, in connecting their products to your platform. Amazing. Uh, I, um, I've got a ton of tactical questions, but I want to kind of complete the, the strategic loop here and maybe dive into uh, at least the, the title subject matter of the webinar up front, which is, you know, there's been some work that you've done more recently around trying to actually incentivize or stimulate or accelerate the creation of these apps, whether it's it's integrations or it's entire companies being built on top of HubSpot. And I'm wondering if you could go into a little more details about that program, uh, maybe just starting with what the original idea was and then how you think about funding something like that and, you know, the impact that you hope it has on your ecosystem. Yeah, uh, very excited about how this has come together. Um, you know, so we were seeing great momentum, you know, over the past few years around integrations, uh, you know, where there was a very clear relationship, uh, you know, between, a, you know, a SaaS company that, you know, was a leader in its particular product area. Uh, HubSpot is a CRM went ahead, uh, you know, the the value proposition, you know, then saying, okay, here's the data that we can pass back and forth between it, you know, uh, pretty clear. Uh, but as we've started to lean more into this platform direction, the questions really become like, okay, what are the opportunities to create net new innovation, net new products, you know, that didn't exist before? And either they might be products that are built really exclusively, you know, for the HubSpot platform, uh, or potentially, you know, uh, new SaaS companies, you know, that use the HubSpot platform really is their starting point, their place to, you know, uh, get a foothold, be able to prove out product market fit, you know, and then maybe grow from there. And so one of the things we wanted to do was find a way to help that segment of the platform ecosystem uh, really be able to gain traction uh, with ideas around HubSpot. So uh, we created this, uh, we did initially as a pilot program, this app accelerator vision. Um, uh, and the idea being is that to create a, a, a really structured, focused program that would start on our end of, you know, working with uh, internal product teams and internal customer teams to be able to uh, compile uh, like where we saw customer demand opportunities, things that we were hearing from the front lines of sales or support, things that people wanted to do. Our product didn't necessarily do it. Um, maybe there wasn't a SaaS integration out there that to do something net new, you know. And so we get this list together. We'd validate it, uh, you know, with our product org that uh, you know these were generally things that we were not planning to build anytime soon. And then uh, to really be able to go to a, a partner community and solicit a cohort uh, you know, of partners that would be interested in having a focused 10 to 12 week process to like evaluate these ideas, each of them being able to pick one that they felt uh, you know, was a great opportunity for them. And then to very closely work with them in the creation uh, of that uh, initial version of that product you know, and uh, closely work meant a combination of being able to uh, give feedback from, you know, our product organization about the specific opportunity, connecting them with the developer advocacy team. If there were questions about, you know, from an architecture perspective or the technical levers that they could pull within the HubSpot platform, you know, having our partner team be able to work with them a little bit around uh, some of the go to market, you know, opportunities. Uh, and we keep these uh, cohorts uh, relatively small, relatively focused, so that we could have that sort of uh, really just close engagement with that set of partners during that two to three month period while they were getting this build out. And then culminate, uh, you know, in a uh, demo day. Uh, you know, we, we, we love the demo days, uh, you know, in the software world. Um, uh, this demo day has really become... Uh, one of the highlights inside, uh, you know, uh, HubSpot, uh, you know, many of our executives, uh, you know, Brian Halligan, Dharma Shaw, you know, would uh, sit in on these demo days, have these partners be able to actually show off uh, what they got built, 
Uh, and then, you know, it's not just a moment of celebration and a moment of awareness, you know, uh, you know, building between these partners and our HubSpot teams, but then a lot of those assets that get created around uh, that demo day then become assets that are fed into a go-to-market plan uh, that we help run to promote the apps uh, out to the broader HubSpot world. Uh, my daughter heard that I had uh, Scott Brinker on the line, so she had to she had to come in and say hi. Uh, um, I, I'm really curious about you know just thinking through the lens of a lot of the people that might be in the audience right now, who may be at companies that are maybe slightly less further along than than HubSpot is. Is was there a sense of testing this idea out or doing kind of like a, uh, an incubation mode or a little, little mini trial mode? Or did you kind of decide strategically, we're going to dive in head first and kind of build and cultivate this, this class, this cohort of, uh, of integrations kind of from zero to one? Yeah, so the strategic view was definitely to be able to build out this kind of the ecosystem of, you know, net new products being launched to the world on top of the HubSpot platform around the HubSpot ecosystem. But the actual mechanisms of how to do that, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, lots of ideas, lots of, uh, you know, hypotheses to be tested. Uh, so when we initially did the first one of these app accelerators, it was very explicitly branded, you know, both to the partners who participated, but also to the participants who supported this inside HubSpot as a pilot. Like, let's see this and like, let's learn it. And, and we learned a tremendous amount. We did essentially three of these, you know, before we considered it officially launched and now a regular, um, you know, program that we're running on a recurring basis. But for instance, like the first one, we were like, oh, okay, well, let's just open this up, you know? And so HubSpot is a fairly large product organization. And we were going around all these different PMs and like soliciting ideas of, you know, places where they saw opportunity. And then for partners too, it was like, hey, is there anything you might imagine wanting to, you know, build on, you know, HubSpot? Um, and they, some great stuff came out of that first cohort. But one of the things we realized is, wow, that, absence of focus made it incredibly difficult to be able to validate ideas internally, to be able to have a clear go-to-market strategy when these things launch. So like very quickly then for the second cohort, you know, we focused that on a particular hub, uh, you know, the CMS hub. And that was a real breakthrough learning for us because now instead of trying to work with the entire product org at once, you know, we could really work with you know one or two PMs uh, who could get deeply engaged. We could have the go-to-market lead, you know, for that particular hub, you know, directly engaged and figuring out how we go to market with this uh, you know cohort. Um, for the ideas that were coming in for partners, you could really keep them focused, you know, on one particular category. When the stuff finally did get released, the messaging that could be done externally to bring attention uh, to these capabilities. Um, yeah, so that was that was one of our learnings was, okay, keep the topic focused. Uh, and then another learning we were uh, sort of <laughs> discovered uh, was, okay, the first one had something like eight companies that were participating. And we're like, great, this is awesome. You know, and then the next one, it grew a little bit more. And then by the time we were getting to the third one, we're like, oh, wow, this is great. Let's just expand this, uh, you know, and we actually for our third uh, accelerator, we had like 60 companies, you know, that applied to participate. We were holding a pretty high bar to who we actually, you know, like let in, like the quality of the idea, the commitments from them to be able, you know, to stick with it for, you know, 12 week period. But even then we ended up ultimately with like 25 companies that were participating in that cohort. And it was a great cohort. There were amazing products that came out of it. But the other thing we learned was, okay, that's too many. You know, that part of the magic of really making this work, you know, both uh, for HubSpotters engaged in it, uh, but more importantly for the partners engaged, is to keep these cohorts relatively small, just so everyone gets the right level of attention. Um, you know, and also again, when we we take this to a demo day or we you know take this to a larger go-to-market plan, you know, that there's a really there's a manageable subset of things, you know, for people to get their head around. So definitely this iterative process uh, has, has been our friend. Awesome. Uh, so are there any particular case studies or uh, things that got built that are in some of those early cohorts that you can point to now and kind of stand out as like your show pieces or like the example of what you, what you hope happens in the best case scenarios when you kind of incubate these projects through 
Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, even with the first cohort, uh, there were a couple of huge wins. Um, uh, so one was a, a capability just built natively on top of HubSpot uh, that HubSpot, you know, had launched our uh, uh, custom objects uh, capability. Um, and there were mechanisms inside HubSpot to create and manage uh, custom objects. But because it's still a relatively new feature, you know, there were definitely a lot of opportunities to create more elaborate ways of like managing and designing custom objects. And a couple of our solutions partners who service, you know, so many of our larger enterprise customers, uh, they had really clear ideas of, you know, how to create a layer on top of that custom objects capability, you know, to just make it a lot more accessible to a lot more people. Um, and frankly, it, I mean, it, it blew people's mind. I mean, even inside our like custom objects team, they saw this in the demo day and they're like, wow, this is incredible. This is awesome. What a great thing. Um, but then also like there was another partner, you know, who recognized that, okay, it wasn't necessarily the need to be a net new product, but there was this universe of Wix, very popular CMS, uh, you know, platform, the universe of HubSpot, and there really wasn't a connection between the two, you know, and so uh, that partner took the opportunity to build really the ultimate Wix HubSpot, uh, you know, uh, connector. Uh, uh, not only did HubSpot get very excited about this, Wix got very excited about it. So now this is the connector that's used to promote, uh, you know, the combination between those two products by both of our companies. Um, so those, those things were like very good just out of the uh, starting gate. But I have to say now, the, by the time we iterated here and we got more and more focused, uh, you know, the last cohort that we did around sales related uh, apps for the CRM, um, I'll, I'll shout out a few. I, I, I'd list all 25, but this is again the problem. It's too many for me to give, you know, uh, credit to all of them. But, you know, like one of them built this amazing like timeline visualizer. Uh, I mean, this is one of the more amazing things I've seen in any CRM anywhere, you know, where they're basically taking all this activity stream data, you know, different contacts inside the company, different contacts inside the account, you know, and putting it together in an actual visualization so you could see the different stages and where things were overlapping and where these different contacts had and the impact it had on shifting stages. I mean, it just, it, it blew my mind. Um, and so I, I, yeah, yeah. I, want that. I can't go yeah, through the other 24, but even just the one, it's like, wow, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's so awesome. You know, one thing that, that stands out to me from those examples is how many of these, you know, when I picture uh, programs like this, I almost always picture that the, the folks that are actually writing the code and putting pen to paper and developing are the technology partners. It's other ISVs, but it sounds like your, your cohorts are, are very full of solution partners and people that are kind of more on the services side who are maybe building technology to help them with their implementations. Is that deliberate or do you think that's just an artifact of like where the resources and the bandwidth and kind of the innovation sits? Yeah, uh, so when this started out, you know, one of the hypotheses was, okay, if there's an existing SaaS company out there and they're building an integration to HubSpot, you know, we were under the impression that, you know, they generally have a really clear idea of what they want. Or if there's questions about it, we sort of handle that, you know, one-on-one -on -one with those partners, you know, but where we felt there was a gap was again, this idea of sort of like net new developers creating things uh, in HubSpot. Uh, and so our solutions partner ecosystem felt like a really great place to start with that because these were companies, they do a lot of HubSpot implementations. They see where there's needs for customers that aren't yet served by software out there. They have some development capacity themselves. Um, so that was great. And for our first two uh, cohorts of this app accelerator, we really made it exclusively on these like ecosystem entrepreneurs. Uh, but then <laughs> partly from the success, you know, that some of those apps had, we had more of our existing SaaS partners come to us and say, wow, this is really cool. Like, could we work with you in one of these as well too? Because we could have our product team like also be able to connect with that product manager and hear the feedback. Um, so we actually, for that third cohort, uh, the one with uh, 25 of them, uh, yeah, I think a good half dozen uh, of those participants were existing partners or other SaaS companies that simply were plugging into that app accelerator format as a way to either launch a net new integration or upgrade uh, the integration that they already had. 
Awesome. And just to double click on the way you pitch the accelerator program to people that are joining, um, obviously there's this proprietary access to product managers inside of HubSpot. And, and I'm sure there's all kinds of, uh, you know, the, the demo days and the visibility and the PR on the back end are super valuable. Do you do anything else uh, in terms of uh, do you subsidize their work at all with a stipend or grants, or do you provide any kind of uh, other incentives like, you know, credits for HubSpot products and things like that? You just tell me like, I guess, and, and my follow-up to that will be, what do you think actually works the best? Like if someone's thinking about launching a program like this, is is the financial incentive a requirement? Or do you think that the intrinsic motivation of just accessing the HubSpot ecosystem is enough? Yeah, um, we had a lot of internal debate about this. To date, we have not provided uh, any subsidy uh, for this. And I think one of the points of view we had on that was for an ecosystem to be really successful, you know, the, there were short term levers that people sometimes pull to like try and artificially, you know, bump things. And there may be very well cases where that is the right move to do. But for us, we were kind of taking this from a longer you know, term perspective of, listen, we really only want people to build something and to invest that time if there's legitimately a real market opportunity there, or at least the probabilities of it being a real market opportunity are significant enough that that partner actually feels like, yes, this is worth it for me. Like I see a way to like build business through this. Uh, and then our role in that is to simply like really help support, you know, that entrepreneurial idea to make sure that they understand where it fits relative to our product roadmap. You know, uh, do we have the right APIs to help them do what they need to do? You know, and once they launch with that cohort, you know, can we give them an extra boost in visibility to start to get that idea traction? And so far, that seems to have been really the right match of just making sure everyone's in this ultimately for the outcome of saying there should be a product that has a life that, you know, it takes onto its own and it's not being artificially held up by either HubSpot or the partner. Yeah, makes a ton of sense. Uh, and I guess like I want to pick on one thing from your early statement, which is kind of the distinction between this idea of people building technology that's complementary or that's an integration versus people building an entire company uh, on top of the HubSpot platform. Uh, and I'm just curious, like, have you seen any instances of that? And that's obviously the 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 dream of everything. And Annie agrees, it's a wonderful question. Uh, it's like, is there, a, uh, uh, is there precedent for that? And, you know, is that where you think this all goes to ultimately have companies where if HubSpot didn't exist, they couldn't exist, as opposed to what they're building just being kind of a force multiplier. Yeah, I think that can go both ways, to be honest. Like, um, I mean, ultimately, right, the thing that, you know, we are focused on is how do we solve uh, things that HubSpot customers want? You know, how do we make sure that, um, you know, prospective HubSpot customers, you know, can find the capabilities they want on our platform? But that being said, yeah, we're, you know, I mean, as we buy into the full platform strategy that it's not, um, you know, it, it is not a single company, you know, in the world. It is a multi, you know, platform heterogeneous cloud out there, you know. And so if partners look at building something on HubSpot as perhaps their initial beachhead of like, okay, this is, you know, we'll focus on this platform and this audience first, we'll get this really figured out, we'll get that traction, you know, and then we will expand to other platforms that they integrate as well too. If that's how they're building a successful business around this, uh, we are thrilled for that, happy for that. So we don't spend a lot of time distinguishing like, oh, are they only for HubSpot, you know, or are they, um, you know, is it a HubSpot capability but they also, you know, are looking to expand that into other cloud apps or other cloud platforms. Uh, I sort of keep a very uh, like, hey, <laughs> you know, whatever actually solves the customer challenges for you and makes uh, helps you build a successful business. Um, we're we're advocates of that. Great. Um, I want to make a plug before uh, the uh, the Q and A functionality here in the chat uh, for anybody that wants to send questions along. Uh, but uh, uh, while those are rolling in on the on the app side, uh, I want to hear a little bit more about what you were doing before HubSpot and some of the work around Chief Martech and just kind of filling in the gaps on 
how somebody with with your background ends up in a role like the one that you've got because if i recall correctly you've got a computer science degree and kind of maybe started out uh, more on the engineering side of the house and we talk a lot in the crossbeam content about the career journey of folks that are leaders in the partnership universe and um you know some folks come from sales some folks come from you know founding teams uh you are uh you're an engineer by training and i'd love to hear more about how that influences uh your work and then how it's kind of guided you down a path uh to hubspot yeah so there are kind of like two different aspects of my background that sort of led me to this role uh, to my my dream job um you know and one of them yeah it started out as a software engineer as a software entrepreneur the company that I had before I joined HubSpot uh, was a company called Ion Interactive. We made a platform for interactive content, things like you know quizzes and assessment tools and stuff like that. And so we were an ISV to other major platforms. People would integrate our product with HubSpot, Salesforce, Marketo, Eloqua. Um, and I will say like, I, I, uh, I learned the both the joy and the frustrations of what it was like to be an ISV in those ecosystems, particularly when many of them were still early in their days and just emerging. Um, uh, and so, yeah, there was this, this long list in my head of like, wow, if only these platforms would do X, you know, it would make it so much easier for us as an ISV, um, you know. Uh, and then the other thing is, yeah, you know, almost by accident over my career, I ended up working at this early intersection between the world of IT and software and marketing, uh, what 20 years ago felt like opposite ends of the universe, uh, you know, and then obviously over these past couple of decades have just, you know, collided and entangled, you know, so tightly. Um, and so, yeah, for 12, 13 years, I've been running that Chief MarTech blog, doing that crazy landscape of, you know, marketing technologies. And again, that was another one where as that, landscape started to grow exponentially over the years, uh, a, a surprise to many people, me included, you know, one of the things that, yeah, it just became so clear was this frustration that marketers had. Well, it was a joy and frustration. It was a joy on the level of like, there's so much innovation out here. There's so many cool things that people are building and, you know, competing with each other for the best solution. But it's somehow all on the shoulders of the marketer figure out, okay, well, how do I actually connect this stuff together? And, you know, I mean, I, I, I got a degree in marketing, not like, you know, enterprise uh, integration, like, how do I do this? You know, and so again, that just felt like there has been an incredible opportunity in MarTech in particular. We now see this expanding into other, you know, categories, sales tech and whatnot too, you know, for platform companies and app developers to just work a little bit better together behind the scenes to make it easier for our mutual customers to, uh, you know, be able to get the best of, you know, what we each offer. And so, yeah, after I sold my, uh, you know, uh, last company, uh, you know, uh, uh, Brian and Dharmesh, you know, gave me the opportunity to join HubSpot and help them with, you know, this platform journey. And so, yeah, I, I it, literally my dream job, partly because, yeah, I get to work with all these companies that I've been following for years anyways. It's just, I, I love to see what entrepreneurs are doing in this space. It's just so amazing. But also I feel like, okay, you know, this is now part of my responsibility, at least in HubSpot's world of, how do we help fix, you know, making these integrations better and easier for customers? And those pain points that I, I have a lot of empathy for as a former ISV myself, you know, how do we uh, as HubSpot, like, you know, make it better and easier for partners who work on our platform? Very cool. And I, I feel like I'd, I'd be remiss not to ask my one inside baseball question about uh, the infographic and its growth over the years. And one of the things I've always wondered, for those of you not familiar, um, the the uh, MarTech conference is something that, uh, that Scott shares and uh, chiefmartech.com is Scott's blog. One thing they do, this marketing technology landscape infographic has existed for what, the last seven years, eight years, maybe longer, mm -hmm. 10 years. It's on its 10 year mark. And this thing has gone from being kind of like a very, uh, you know, consumable, very kind of a, and a really nice snapshot where you could spend an hour or two and actually look at every logo and say, oh, I know that company. Oh, I have, I'm not familiar with that one. To the point where like, it's an exercise in the 
uh, absolute absurdity of how prolific marketing technology has become. And I think where where I see it used probably most commonly these days is, you know, it's it's put in slide decks less to say, hey, here's a particular sector that's exploding in size, and more to say, this market is huge. Uh, and I, I guess I'm, I'd be really curious just to get a little bit more of the process around how you actually assemble this thing year to year. You know, do you have a, a, a Google sheet somewhere where you're just keeping a giant list of every single one people send you and you track? Is there a threshold by which if it hasn't reached a certain point of maturity, it won't make it on? Like I, uh, uh, not to get too technical, it's just, I see this thing. I can't have a week go by without it popping up in my life somewhere. And I'd love to get a little more details on how it comes together. Yeah, well, how it's, started coming together is very different than how it ultimately ended up. Um, you know, it's one thing when you're talking about, you know, a few hundred uh, logos. And the way I originally had built this was to just put my hat of a marketer looking for solutions for like, oh, all right, well, what can I do to, you know, help my content marketing? You know, and you go out and you Google everything and you look at the conferences that are covering this, you know, and you read, you know, the analyst reports, you know, and you start to assemble like a list of like, okay, for every different category, what are the things I find? And, you know, I don't definitely at that scale, I, you know, I'm not doing a deep analysis on each one of these companies. It's, it's doing enough, you know, like, you know, five, 10 minutes of due diligence to be able to go in and see like, okay, can I even understand what they're doing on their website? You know, do they have customers or their case studies? You know, is there a funding, you know, that has come in? Um, again, it was never really intended to be a uh, analysis vehicle. You know, it was really just sort of like a, hey, how big is the MarTech space? What are the things that people are doing out there? As it expanded into the thousands and thousands, um, I mean, you can just do the math, absolutely impossible for any one person to do that. Um, last year, it was a team of nine people, you know, working with me to actually create that list, validate. We, we had people send in right. suggestions, we validate them yeah. the same way, uh, you know, as we would any of the ones we organically found. Uh, you know, there was a designer who specialized just in figuring out how to get all this stuff on one sheet. And to be honest, we, ha we haven't produced one yet here for 2021, just because, to be honest, the, the landscape keeps growing. I mean, if I was going to take a guesstimate right now, like I know last year we had 8,000 solutions on that landscape. Um, this year would easily have been over 10,000 um, using the same criteria we'd used before. And it's just, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's uh, becoming a, a, a logistical challenge. Um, and also, I, I, you know, this is an open question. I'd love if, you know, folks chime in here, is I almost feel like at some level, it's served its purpose. Like, you know, this thing was, you know, it really did change people's minds on saying we are living in a very different kind of software environment today than we were 10 years, certainly 20 years ago. And so even the way we think about it, whether we're on the supply side or the demand side, you know, of who our competition set is, or, you know, how we think as a company of, you know, building out these stacks and getting them to work together. Um, I think kind of everyone now recognizes we're just genera generationally, you know, in a very different place. I'm not sure if seeing a slide of MarTech that has 10,000 logos instead of 8,000 logos at this time, will change that conversation enough necessarily to make it worth, you know, like six months of 20 people doing that, but maybe. <laughs> yeah, there comes a point where you can always zoom out so far that you can just write an <laughs> algorithm to randomly assign pixels and it'll kind of get the it'll kind of get the point across. Uh, yeah, that uh, thank you for that uh, inside yeah. view. That's that's great. Um, I do see a couple of questions coming in from the Q&A here, uh, kind of getting back to the universe of the App Accelerator. Um, can you talk a little bit about how corp dev folds into or doesn't fold into the accelerator strategy? We've got a question about has the program led to any acquisitions yet, or do you, is that even something that you think about, uh, or is it kind of a you know only nice if it happens, but not a not part of the plan? Yeah, it hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, and I think that's to some degree, uh, uh, simply the, the stage we're at both as an accelerator and as a platform, the kinds of companies that are being built uh, natively on top of HubSpot or being launched on HubSpot, you know, it's really just been the past year, you know, that we've started to see some of these things uh, happen and emerge. So I think it's, I think it's early for, you know, those to get traction. 
but I expect we will see uh, some really interesting companies, you know, emerge through that process that will, uh, you know, be of interest uh, to uh, many sources of uh, capital out there. Um, you know, and then of course also, uh, you know, on HubSpot's, you know, like uh, venture and corp dev side, uh, you know, uh, HubSpot's been steadily growing, you know, its engagement, uh, you know, with HubSpot ventures. Um, uh, and so I think, uh, yeah, as you start to see, you know, the scale of that uh, move forward, that will also open up some more interesting opportunities for how do we connect the dots across these two programs. Yeah, I'm sure it's all very intertwined. And uh, as a, we are a, a HubSpot Ventures portfolio company here at Crossbeam, and I can uh, I can vouch for just the level of kind of strategic support that exists there, and uh, it's it's been a really really great experience. And I think as more large established companies are developing these corporate VC funds, it gives a really interesting parallel path uh, to kind of this app acceleration work because typically the companies they invest in also fit probably similar profiles to you know, what the upside scenario of, of the accelerator uh, companies look like. So um, it seems like a great, great couple of strategies dovetailing with each other in, in really good ways. By the way, I will say one other thing about the app accelerator um, that we did not fully anticipate going into it, um, but in retrospect was one of the larger side benefits of this is the feedback to our product organization about how to improve our platform, you know, and what sort of capabilities we could create to better empower developers. Oh my goodness, that was, you know, I mean, continues to be now my favorite part, uh, you know, of these accelerators is because just once you now have, you know, those one-on-one -on -one conversations happening between the people creating these products and the PMs who are responsible for domains of that within the platform, you know, I mean, the synapses start firing, you know, it's just everybody starts to see the same shared visions. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, again, lots of ways you get feedback into a developer ecosystem and a platform, but, you know, I would say that dimension, you know, of the program did not anticipate how valuable that could be. And that's been just through the roof. Awesome. And that's actually a really good segue into a question that came in through the Q and a here around just like your North star metrics for what success looks like for the accelerator program. Uh, I could imagine everything from directly attributing ARR to it, to, you know, how many API calls get made, to how many customer accounts get touched. How do you, it's like a really complicated question. How do you think about what success actually looks like? Yeah, that's a great question uh, because there are a variety of metrics uh, and the reality is we triangulate, you know, on a lot of them, but our North Star metric across the entire universe uh, of, uh, you know, both integration partners and then these, you know, app accelerator participants uh, is active installs with customers. You know, um, so we, we aren't involved in like the transaction, like we don't, you know, sell people's products, you know, through our marketplace, you know, we're not taking a slice, we're not taking any revenue uh, from that, uh, you know, either, you know, it's really, ultimately for us, it's all about how successful our partners at in getting things integrated uh, in live HubSpot portals, because in many ways, this feels like, okay, it everyone wins, you know, the partner wins because we know they've got an integration and either that was a net new sale for them, or if it was an existing customer of theirs, they've at least deepened, you know, that relationship. Uh, we know it's a success for the customer because, okay, if it's an install, they don't just try it once, but they actually install it and they keep it. We pretty easily can infer they are getting value, uh, you know, out of that integration on the platform. Uh, and then for HubSpot, you know, for us, the, the correlation between customers being able to use more apps and integrations on top of HubSpot, you know, and then the customer dollar retention, you know, and lifetime value for those customers to HubSpot, that also has an up and to the right correlation too. And so it's not the perfect metric, but, you know, out of, you know, for one metric that's simple for everyone to understand that seems to align well, you know, for partners, customers, and HubSpot, uh, that's the best one we've found so far. It makes a lot of sense. I feel like the the thing that I'm always worried about with picking the wrong metric is do you create unintentional perverse incentives for anybody to kind of not do the right thing? Uh, and, and I love when uh, it really is like it's like a product led growth metric at the end of the day, uh, where you're you're focused on something that's very directly tied to utilization and customer value, and um, you know the 
uh, you can do plenty of uh, analysis on how those things are linked and correlated uh, and causal to all the other good stuff that the, the business cares about. So that's that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, uh, that's another place where there was a bit of an evolution. Like when we started this, that metric was simply installs. Was there ever an install between an app and a portal? but not keeping track of then what happened down the road. And that shift towards really making a focus on active installs, that it's not just something that got installed once, but the customers continued to retain that, feel like that actually ends up doing a much better job of just making sure everyone's aligned. Uh, it, you, it, it, it's harder to game that, you know, like either people actually have these apps and they keep them and they use them um, or yeah, it's smoke and mirrors. Well, that's great. That that little nuance, you know, maybe is uh, will save somebody in the audience a good six months of uh, <laughs> North Star optimization. That's awesome. Um, you know, there's there's a really there's a question uh, in the Q and A about your recruiting strategy for the program and just how it is that you find these ISVs and SIs in general. And I, you know, part of me wants to say, well, the answer is obvious. It's HubSpot. Uh, <laughs> they just show up and knock on your door, and there's there's like a center of gravity that exists where you have a lot to choose from. But I'm wondering if that's if you would agree with that answer, you feel like there is actually proactive outbound effort that's happening in any way to make sure that you're getting precisely the right people aware and, and involved. Yeah, so one of the reasons, you know, again, starting this out as a pilot, um, you know, we were less concerned about like, oh, how many people out in the universe can we, you know, drive into this, you know, but can we just start with some small groups, you know, and make sure that this works, make sure there's a way to actually create value for everyone, you know, and so we, when we even launched it, we had a set of, you know, our solutions partners in the service ecosystem that were already, you know, they had developer capability. We'd had chats with them. Uh, you know, it seemed like a very natural group to say, hey, listen, we're thinking of trying this program. Would you be interested in participating in this? You know, we had some other independent developers that just our teams had connected with organically. Um, you know, so we had a pretty good universe to start with. Um, and then with the, you know, by the time we got to the end of this third, uh, you know, cohort uh, earlier this year, um, we finally felt like, okay, we've we've got the model here established enough that we're we are ready to you know open up the floodgates because, again, if you're gonna try and keep the size of any one cohort you know relatively small, then you know part of this is also like, okay, how do we start to systematically scale? different cohorts, you know, staggered over time. Uh, so we weren't even really ready for, uh, you know, uh, a, a significant influx, uh, you know, until very recently. Um, and now it's a, it's a lot of evangelism, you know, of like making sure that as people, you know, come and they look at, you know, the developer platform, you know, for HubSpot, if they're, you know, thinking about building their own SaaS app or, even if they're building an app, you know, for a, you know, one-off customer, but it becomes like a seed for, hey, maybe I can turn this into, you know, uh, a, a product, you know, just making sure that we get visibility at the places where they are just naturally discovering the opportunities to look at HubSpot and say, oh, well, maybe this particular program could be a good fit for me. Perfect. Uh, so one last question that's in the Q&A. Uh, is from Pete. Hey, hey, it's Scott. Do you believe it? We got him. Uh, the uh, I, I think there's some curiosity that exists out there, just because I bet almost everybody in the audience is in the HubSpot app marketplace in in one flavor or another. Uh, I'd be curious if you could just share a little bit more about the evolution or like the partner journey from you know initial prototype to what does it take to actually appear in the app marketplace, all the way to what's it mean to reach the spotlight or to be on stage at inbound or to kind of be one of those those real featured partners can you just talk through folks that aspire to be in that last category what's the journey sure well i mean again step one is actually building uh you know building an app uh you know understanding where you see an opportunity and what you want to build there um you know for getting listed in our marketplace we've We've tried to keep the bar, you know, reasonable for people to get going. That we look to see, okay, do you have at least three active installs on other HubSpot customer portals, not just your own? You know, so you're responsible for kind of, you know, proving out that early alpha test or beta test with some real customers. Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, do analysis of, you know, just making sure that the app meets requirements for, you know, uh, it, it authenticates through OAuth. You know, 
that there's the right documentation for it, you know, people agreeing to privacy policies and things like that. So it's it's a relatively straightforward thing to get listed. You know, then there are various levers that, you know, we have both programmatically and more importantly, the partner has for them to start to accelerate, you know, visibility and adoption um, at a, the three month uh, part, uh, point now, uh, you know, if uh, starting to get acceleration, there's a certification uh, program we offer that people can go through our technical team. Now that you have a much larger set of historical API traffic, you know, can really do a deeper dive to validate that, yep, you know, these calls are, you know, they're, they're being properly used, they're not exceeding limits, you know, there aren't these errors being generated, uh, you know, and so, and then this is slowly gaining momentum where, you know, you then have like a certified app uh, badge, it's more of a trust signal you know, to get greater adoption. And then what we do from a uh, promotional perspective, aside from like just the programmatic ways, you know, that people can tap into getting the word out, um, is we've been working very closely with our marketing team to, to really find the alignment where when, uh, you know, every month we've got campaigns that our marketing team is doing. We work with those teams in advance to understand, okay, for the things that HubSpot is going to be promoting, Anyway, like it's a main theme for what we're trying to uh, help uh, educate customers and prospects about what's possible. You know, how do we make sure early on that we're also able to align partners from the ecosystem who are really a good fit, you know, with those particular campaigns, uh, get them vetted for that, get them to participate in that, get them visibility for it. Um, you know, and I think then, yeah, as, as you ladder up there, you know, as there become more and more opportunities for campaigns and things that get celebrated at inbound, uh, you know, being able to just make sure the matching happens, you know, that the right solutions from partners, you know, align with, uh, you know, the themes and announcements that HubSpot is doing, you know, that we can create those uh, highlight connections. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's good for everyone. Incredible, super, super helpful. Uh, frankly, even for us here, here at Crossbeam, uh, proud members of that, that ecosystem. Um, so I guess maybe my last question for you is what am I not asking about that I should be? Uh, you know, what, uh, is there anything else about the kind of current story in your world that's exciting and of interest and you might want to share? Wow, uh, such a great uh, open-ended question there. Um, you know, I I just saw some more data on this. This has been my pet peeve with Chief Martech, even before I joined HubSpot, is, you know, we talked about this earlier. Customers still feel pain with integrations, you know, and to be honest, a lot of integrations out there, and it's not just within HubSpot, it's like everywhere. It's like, there's a lot of shallow integrations, things that like, okay, well, we can pass some data between your product and our product. And okay, it's, it's, it's better than nothing. It's a good, you know, a good place to start, you know, but for a lot of time, for a lot of customers, you know, the use cases of what they really want to be able to leverage two products for, the out of the box integration doesn't necessarily give them that. And they have to figure out how to then, okay, given the lighter weight integration, how do they, you know, uh, build something on top of that. But now when I see, you know, the, the, the superstars, you know, the com companies, the ISVs who they're actually thinking about their integration as a lever, as a competitive lever that, oh, okay, well, the way this works with HubSpot is so much better than what any of our other competitors do in the way that they, uh, you know, integrate with HubSpot. This becomes really cool. And it's it definitely become increasingly the focus, you know, of my team is like, okay, how do we work with the partners um, more that they really want to leverage an integration is not just a check the box. Yes, there's an integration, but a real feature advantage, you know, and what do we need to do to support them on our end, you know, whether that's from, you know, technical capabilities, uh, or then once they've got something that's like, wow, this is really worth shouting from the rooftops about. I mean, would you look at this? This is so cool the way these two things work together, you know, make sure that we can really lend as much weight to the promotion and the spotlight of that uh, for the success of that uh, partner, for customers to take advantage of it. And also, yeah, start to just show this model to more companies that want to use integrations, not as a, yeah, eat your spinach. I guess we have to do that to like, oh yeah, this is this is how we win in the heterogeneous uh, you know cloud universe in which we're all competing. 
Incredible. Uh, Scott, uh, this has been amazing. Uh, I, I could continue on for hours. I love that we were able to focus on a, a couple of thin slices here and go deep. Um, great questions from the audience. Uh, folks, as always, keep an eye out for the latest and greatest from Scott uh, over on the HubSpot blog and over at Chief Martech and, uh, uh, of course, in the Cloud Software Association community. Um, I want to shout out the in-person event, November 9th and 10th, SAS Connect in San Francisco. Uh, hoping to see all of you there. But until then, uh, huge thanks again to Scott. Uh, huge thanks to Annie, our special guest star here today. And uh, we're going to look forward to seeing everybody in person before too long. So virtual high fives all around. And thanks for coming to this edition of SAS Connect one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks all.